Good morning and welcome to the 2022 North Carolina Science and Engineering Fair. We are so happy to be here this morning and to kick us off for our live events today will be Dr. Rachel Graham. And so Dr. Graham is the current chairwoman of the North Carolina Science Fair Foundation Board of Directors who hosts this event every year in partnership with North Carolina State University. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. And Rachel, I will pass it over to you. Thank you, Teresa, and welcome everyone to the 34th North Carolina Science and Engineering Fair. We have representatives here from all nine regions, and we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the regional fair directors for their hard work and dedication in helping us make this statewide fair possible. We have some of the brightest minds in North Carolina being tested here today, so I encourage everyone to enjoy the day. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors whose contributions enable us to work toward achieving our goal of reaching all 100 North Carolina counties to engage them in science, technology, engineering, and math related studies. And our sponsors include the Biogen Foundation, as well as our platinum sponsors, Red Hat, Bros Welcome Fund, and SMT Center. Our gold sponsors are RTI, Broadcom Foundation, Tunnel, DLH, and the Society for Science. Our silver sponsors are Wiley Wilson, and our bronze sponsors are Roe and C. We also have partners with, with North Carolina State um, Science and Engineering Fair, the, the NC State University, Meredith College, the Strawbridge Studios, Stem Wizard, and Forager One. And so uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Danika Scott. Dr. Scott is a Vice Chancellor and Dean for the Division of Academic and Student Affairs at North Carolina State University. In her role there, she manages the integration of all aspects of undergraduate education, serves as a key strategic advisor to the provost, is Dean of University College, and works to support the success of the whole student. She also holds a secondary appointment as a professor of practice in the Department of Educational Leadership, Policy and Human Development in the NC State College of Education. Prior to joining NC State in 2021, Dr. Scott served as an Associate Vice Provost and Associate Dean for Student Success at the University of Oregon. A toxicologist and emergency medicine practitioner by training, she received her Doctor of Pharmacy from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and she also received a Master of Arts in Higher and Post-Secondary Education from the University of Michigan. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Danika Scott. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Um, it's great to be here this morning. And so a hearty welcome um, to every student and everyone uh, for the fair this year. We're excited to welcome students from all over, um, from all of the 100 counties in North Carolina. Um, NC State's mission as a land grant institution is to serve all areas of North Carolina. And we're proud to host this important event as part of that mission. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I feel so quite honored to, to be asked to give this welcome because these events are quite important to me. Um, I am a first generation college student um, and was really interested in math and science. Um, so my counselor said, you love math, you love chemistry. How about chemical engineering, which was great. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't necessarily know because I didn't have anyone who could tell me, but when I got to college, I just, I found myself, I, I just found my peeps, right? And, and had this really amazing experience. So I basically went to college and never left. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just been a great ride. The, the opportunity to work um, in this environment, ensuring that students are successful, um, is, is a calling. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about NC State, uh, it, being here fairly new, it's like, you know, I, I'm new, I, I finally figured it out. And once I did, here I am. Um, I, I am excited to have you really be here thinking through um, questions 
in answering them. So being really inquisitive, really figuring out and thinking about what are, what are some of our global problems or issues and how can I solve them, right? Um, so that is really, really exciting to me. Um, and, it, and actually the inquiry in that way has been my path to where I am today. So starting probably in elementary school, I was always inquisitive, always had questions, always tried to find answers and it continued on. And so research in general um, is just really identifying those problems, those questions, and coming up with answers. And so uh, there are multiple ways that you, you can engage what you have with your projects today. Um, so multiple ways you can engage in all types of di different disciplines. Um, today is uh, the fair for science and engineering, but you may find when you get to college that there are other uh, questions that you wanna answer and you will have amazing faculty there to help guide you in that. Um, but ultimately, you know, you are the leaders of our great nation and um, you know, solving our grand challenges and problems and thinking here at NC State, we talk often about think and do, right? So um, being able to do that. And so I will leave with um, one thing, just remain curious, try new things, keep dreaming. And we truly look forward to you matriculating at NC State. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott. It's wonderful to have you with us. And we love that we share your passion for that curiosity and the think and do mindset. So thank you so much. I did drop a chat in the, or a link in the chat for you all if you wanna learn more about uh, Dr. Scott and that will bring you also to the NC State website where you can learn a lot more about the university. So once again, thank you, Dr. Scott. And with that, we're going to move forward with our next, the next stage of our welcome. So students, excuse me while I reshare my screen, we have one more distinguished guest who is going to welcome us to the North Carolina Science and Engineering Fair. And so in North Carolina, we do have a structure where we have a public servant who is the state superintendent for public instruction. And that superintendent is Catherine Truitt. And she was not able to join us live this morning, but she did send us a welcome video. And so we're gonna play it now so that you hear her welcome and congratulations, but also it is available on the symposium website. And so I will mute myself and we will hear from Dr. Catherine Truitt. Hello everyone, and welcome to the 34th annual North Carolina Science and Engineering Fair. My name is Katherine Truitt, and I serve as the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to join you all virtually and cannot wait to hear about your incredible work on display. First, I'd like to congratulate you all on qualifying for this year's fair. Winning at your regional science fairs and progressing to the State Science and Engineering Fair is no small feat, and you should all be very proud. It's all the more impressive that you are able to compete in a completely virtual event. I know that format has presented challenges for you all, and it's admirable that it hasn't deterred you from making this competition a priority. You should all be proud of yourselves for navigating your way through a virtual environment and making it to this point. What an accomplishment. I'm also elated to see so many students interested in STEM fields, and I can't wait to see what progress our state makes over the next few years in these subjects. Science, technology, engineering, and math are some of the most important foundational skills in life. These fields encourage critical thinking and problem solving, and STEM experts go on to make major developments and contributions to our society, like the COVID vaccine, for example. Your interest in STEM will only open greater doors for you in the future, and today is only part of that journey. This fair is giving you a hands-on opportunity to research your findings like real scientists and engineers. You are learning, exploring, observing, and experimenting in ways that will prepare you for the future. That is incredibly exciting, and I hope you all leave this fair feeling inspired by others and motivated to continue pursuing this path. Catherine Truitt's office is at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction and her team is always looking to hear from students about education in North Carolina. And so we hope that as you enter the fair this morning, you feel the warmth and support of all of these organizations who are in North Carolina specifically to serve you 
Um, we would love to hear your voice in all of these places. NC State would love to have you visit and tour. Um, and in North Carolina, we have one particular person who has spent her whole career supporting students in their research. And so I am honored to be able to introduce to you Judy Day, who is our State Fair Director. She is also our liaison for the International Fair and works with a group of fair directors across the nation to make sure students have access to these opportunities. Um, and she's currently our Region 5 Interim Director and for the fair this year, she's also our Judging Coordinator. So Judy wears many, many hats and I'm excited to introduce her to you. And she's gonna give you a little bit of what to expect with the fair today. Judy? All right, thank you. All right, so good morning. It is wonderful to talk to all of you. It has been um, an interesting day already with lots of things happening and trying to get judges to the right room and students to the right room and making sure that everyone is where they need to be to be able to get started. So if you will look at the schedule for the day, we do have a lot of virtual opportunities for you with the symposium. And we want you to participate in as many of these as possible. Um, and you can see what, and this, what the schedule is as you look at symposium. The passports that you were sent earlier should be completed and turned in by 4 p.m. So you'll be eligible to be in the drawing for the gift cards that we will be giving out to the students that turn in the completed passports. And so a little bit of thank you that I need to give. Um, Teresa talked about what I've been doing, but we have over 100 judges that have been working yesterday and today to be able to talk to the students and to be able to share some of their excitement that they have in their careers in science and engineering technology and mathematics. And they've been very excited about doing this and really um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about your projects. So please go into the interviews knowing that the judges have been waiting to talk to you and they are really wanting to hear what you have to say. Um, and it should be a fun experience and don't let it be anything that is, is threatening to you because they're excited and we want you to be excited as well. Um, we do have to give out awards, but they really are there to learn about you and, and to be able to communicate with you, um, their experiences with your experiences and um, be able to share that information. So as the day continues, if you have any issues connecting with your uh, interview session, you have my contact information. I'm not gonna give it out over Zoom, but you all have my contact information in multiple emails. Please text me or let me know, um, call me on the phone to say you're having problems so that we can rearrange things and get you in place the way you need to be or schedule you for a makeup appointment. We really, our goal is to have every student interviewed that is supposed to be interviewed for the awards. Um, so getting to the awards, our award ceremony will, ceremonies are all tomorrow afternoon and you will connect to those award ceremonies by going through the symposium link just like you did today. And the elementary awards will be at 2 p.m. The junior awards will be at 3 p.m. And the senior awards will be at 4 p.m. Now they are all open to the public. So if anybody you want to invite to attend, can attend the award ceremony. Today is open to the public. So if you're doing the two minutes with the mic or if you want someone else to hear any of the things that are happening, please share that information. They can join us, they can go to that same link and be able to participate with us. And tomorrow is the same way. Please feel free to share that with anyone that you would like to because anyone can participate. We will be recording the um, award ceremonies so if something happens and you're unable to attend, you'll be able to see it later after we post the recordings on the symposium site. So if something happens, you'll still be able to see that. We will be posting the awards on our STEM wizard registration site, probably Monday morning for you to be able to see and have a list of who won all of the various awards uh, as well. If you have any questions again today, please let me know. Um, send me those messages, send me an email, and I will be responding to them as fast as I can. I've been busy this morning. I've already been talking to a number of students, 
to a number of judges. So if I don't answer you immediately, I uh, will get to you as soon as I, as fast as I can handle it. And I want you to have a wonderful, exciting day today. Listen to what everybody has to say. Have fun sharing your research. And this is only the beginning. So we really want all of you to stay engaged. Just keep on asking those questions, looking for the answers, seeking out problems that you want to be able to solve and creating all of the solutions that we need for tomorrow because you are the generation that will be supporting people like me. So thank you for all that you are doing and continue on in your interests and in your hopefully maybe consider careers in those fields. Take care. All right, thank you, Judy. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, let me just pop that up. Okay, so with that, we are going to shift to kind of an overview of the live events for the day. And so as you think about the Science and Engineering Fair, we have the live events going on throughout the day so that you are able to have a more complete fair experience. Um, and so in this virtual world, that will involve joining a, a series of live speakers for the day. So thank you for joining us for the opening ceremony this morning. And I am going to just give you a little bit of a preview of what to expect. And as Judy said, you can get to all of these live events through the symposium platform. And I dropped that link in the chat and it's in your emails um, through, so that you can join us throughout the day as you can. The top priority for you is to make your judging interview time. So if you are junior or senior division, please make sure that you are paying attention to the clock as you pop in and out of the live events. You should be able to join even if we're halfway through a session. You're welcome to join us at any time throughout the day. And so what we're gonna open our morning with starting at 1030 is a series of Spark Talks. And the four speakers who are coming for our Spark Talks are really hoping to inspire you and to push your thinking and to make you ask some good questions, rethink maybe how you think about your process um, in research or how you will enter college. We already saw Maya asked a great question in the chat about what if you're undecided. And I think you'll hear from our Spark speakers that when we are working uh, through college and through our research pathways, there are many, many ways to find uh, the pathway to meet our passions. And so you will hear from several researchers who are undergraduate students at NC State. And you will also hear from a middle school researcher from North Carolina who has this interest in mechanics. And he's gonna talk to you about kind of how he got involved into research. Um, and how when you start doing something, you might have one thing in mind and it often changes. And so our Spark speakers today are going to be Victoria and Anish. And then following those two, we will have Noah and Shannon. And they're great examples and inspiration for different pathways you can take through research and through the university should you choose to go that route. Following our Spark Talks, we are going to have a lunch speaker. We have tried to make sure that there are very few, if none, no interviews during the lunch talk today. And our distinguished guest is Tony Rice. And he has, he's a man of many hats, which is a great example for you all. So we hope you'll join that lunch speaker uh, to learn a little bit about how he has taken his many interests and brought them together. He's gonna focus on moving beyond reading and mathematics being important and into bringing the world of coding into those subset of skills that we're going to need moving forward. And so Tony does work as a development uh, security operations architect at Cisco, which is a networking systems organization. Uh, but he also follows his passion as a contributor to WRAL and to Fox Weather. So you might see Tony on television doing little pieces, uh, little segments for a couple of different, especially weather and meteorology events. He also has a passion for astronomy and he works as a NASA ambassador. And so excited to hear Tony's message. He's gonna talk for about half an hour and then give you the opportunity for Q and A. So I encourage you, we're gonna break at 11.30 to run and grab some food and sit back down and listen to Tony sharing and then ask him great questions. He is definitely a critical thinker and he wants to keep your curiosity alive. Um, 
following that, we do have tours of North Carolina State University. While we weren't able to be on campus this year, we do have live tours coming uh, immediately following the lunch speaker. So right at 1220, we will shift from our distinguished guest speaker into live tours. We have two representatives of NC State who are going to help us kind of imagine the world on campus and what it feels like to be a student uh, in the colleges of, College of Sciences. Uh, and then finally, and this is absolutely, all of our events are fun and exciting, but this is my favorite piece of the day. And this is the opportunity for you all to hear from each other. And so the way two minutes with a mic works is those of you who signed up have received a schedule. If you didn't see it, go ahead and check your email right now. It's in there. And we will have every research project. We'll have two minutes and I will help to facilitate passing the microphone. And this is where you get to get that live fair experience of walking around and asking the other students, hey, you know, what is your research about? And this is a rapid sharing of research and I will help facilitate passing the mic. And this is your opportunity to share with the public. And so with that, that will last the whole afternoon. We will do our best. The schedule includes every student. If you miss your time, I will do my best to help you make it up at the end of the speaking session. And so if you happen to miss it for any reason, just pop up and say, Teresa, I'm sorry, I missed my slot. Can I go now? And the answer will be yes. And so I'm excited to have that, to be hosting that. I have the wonderful job of hosting the live events all day. All right, so those are the live events. And then we wanna talk about the fair for next year. So we do have the statewide fair every year and we encourage you to either continue your research and do a continuation project or find a new question to explore if you feel like you've got the answer you needed this year. And to join us again for a science and engineering fair, engage in that regional fair. If your school doesn't have a fair, remember you can reach out to your regional director and connect and say, how do I do this if my school is not hosting a local fair? And bring your friends next year. We do hope to be back live and face-to-face -face on NC State's campus next year. It is a great way for us to bring researchers together from all over the state, much like we're doing virtually today. Um, and very excited to be back on campus. And so with that, we are wrapping up our welcome ceremony. Thank you to everyone, Dr. Graham, Dr. Scott, and Ms. Day for sharing with us this morning. And what we're gonna do is we are going to pause for a minute, let you all get your bearings. We're gonna get our spark speakers ready to go. And we will resume again right at 1030. So thank you all so much for joining us. You do not need to leave the Zoom. You can stay here and I will just mute and we will pause the recording while you all take a quick break before the live events start. So spark talks are really meant to spark new ideas and to inspire you. So we hope you enjoy this as we go throughout the day. I apologize, it says three speakers, that's not right. We have four speakers and they will each speak for 10 minutes. Um, and then we will allow for Q and A. So as the speakers talk, you're welcome to drop questions in the chat. Um, and I will be happy to throw them to them after their 10 minutes have passed. So we want you to get inspired. We want you throughout the day to always be curious and asking great questions as all researchers do um, and to cheer each other along as we go throughout the day. Show your thanks. We do have with us Victoria and Anish and then following Victoria and Anish, we will have Shannon and then Noah. And so that's the order you should expect. I am going to get us started with our very first Spark speaker, and that is Victoria. And so just a little bit about Victoria as she starts and gets ready for her talk. Victoria is a senior at North Carolina State University and is graduating in May 2022. Hooray, that's very soon, with a BS in bioprocess engineering and a minor in biomanufacturing. Victoria is passionate about using microbial technology to change food systems and medicine. 
While at NC State, she has led two unique research projects and contributed to six peer-reviewed publications. She's given a TEDx talk about the Pig in the Pines project, a passion project using enzymes and pyrolysis to develop a novel solution to animal wastewater treatment. She's also president of the Honor Society for Agricultural and Biological Engineers and a teaching assistant for organic chemistry. And with that, I will pass the microphone and I'll stop sharing my screen over to Victoria. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen in just a second. Um, if everybody, while I'm getting that all set up, if everybody could put in the chat, Know where you're coming in from just so I have an idea as well as your age and research interest. That would be great for me. Hello everybody. Um, so my name is Victoria Augustides. I currently go to NC State. Um, as Teresa said, I graduate in May, which is kind of crazy for me, honestly. Um, I remember being a high school senior and it was wild then, but it's even crazier now because I actually started grad school at UNC in the fall, which is also kind of insane. Um, so let me go ahead and get, so today what I will be talking to you guys about is I will be trying to convince you that um, I was supposed to be able to move my video around, but it's not letting me today. So we're just gonna roll with it. Um, I will be trying to convince you all today that SpongeBob SquarePants, yes, SpongeBob SquarePants. I know you probably all probably grew up with SpongeBob. Maybe, you know, maybe your parents didn't let you watch him, but just purely at the sponge himself, I will be trying to convince you that he is the same as my research project. And yeah, like I said, I'm having trouble moving my video around, but we will just keep rolling with it. Um, so, my waste, or sorry, my research project is in waste management, and waste is is really an important topic because waste is all around us. And my background is in chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, and that has allowed me to explore everything from growing cells that glow in the presence of cancer to designing bridges and air conditioning for your house. With this broad background. I was privileged to pick and choose what my research would be in college as an undergraduate. I chose research on making biological innovation from waste. Waste comes from everywhere and everything. Everyone in the audience today, I'm sure, has seen waste before. Maybe it's the food scraps from a delicious dinner that you made. Maybe it's a pair of shoes that you've thrown away because they were too small to use anymore. Can you guys put in the chat for me, kind of like we did just a second ago about where you were from, um, about like the last kind of waste you saw. So maybe that was your dinner waste, maybe that was some clothes you threw away, maybe it was some trash you saw on the street walking to school. Um, so if you guys can just put that in the chat, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So I really believe that a lot of the problems that we face in the world today. Um, so on the far left, you can see this is some drought um, that is in an agricultural field. There's not a lot of water. The ground's all cracked. You can imagine the problems this would cause um, if you're trying to grow crops. And then in the middle, we have this huge pile of food waste um, from a grocery store that people were throwing out. It probably shouldn't have been thrown out, in my opinion. And then on the far right here, we have new medicine. So what does all of this have in common? All of these things can be solved with waste and created with waste. And I know like food waste, it's like, well, isn't this already waste? Yeah, but you can, there are other ways that you can use another type of waste to treat this kind of waste. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but in my research, I'm turning everyday materials um, as well as agricultural waste into powerful tools to remove contaminants from water. Specifically, I'm turning pine bark from biolo into biologically activated carbon to remove compounds from swine waste. So let's talk a little bit more about activated carbon. Before we do that, we go ahead and look at what you guys said. Oh, so many answers. Thank you guys for being so engaged today. Water waste, this more water waste, pistachio shells. We actually use some pistachio shells in my lab. That's really cool. Old tire in the road, 
Thank you, Ava. Water waste, food container waste. That's another really good one. Paper waste, paper waste is a big issue. Banana peels, banana peel, orange peels, cereal bar wrapper. Wow. Mango peels, organic waste, water bottle, <laughs> Slim Jim wrapper. Thank you for the specificity, Ryan. That's great. So all of these different things, if you think about the atoms at the base level, all of these different things, for sure, if it's an organic waste, so if it comes from nature, it probably has carbon in it, and which is a great segue into activated carbon. So what is activated carbon? Activated carbon is a really special and a simple yet very powerful technology. If you think of some common household items like you put in the chat, um, another common household item I'm sure maybe some of you have is like a fish tank or a Brita filter, things that filter water out. These very likely have activated carbon in them because activated carbon works through filtrating contaminated compounds from the air or water and getting them caught in this pore matrix on the left. I don't know if you guys can see that, but on the left of the screen, um, you have all of these little channels within the carbon itself. And that's how it works to purify your water and your air. And we actually make that in my lab. So this phenomena is really important when thinking about how we can turn waste into activated carbon to be used to solve the contaminants released from other waste. Um, and so when you think at the molecular level about what that actually looks like, there are two really important things. There's absorption, where particles from one substance are being absorbed to another, but there's also desorption, where those particles are breaking apart and being released. And so as engineers and scientists, once we understand how one material behaves with the other, we can control it and use it to solve problems at the tiny molecular level. And you'll see that in a second. Um, but I told you, right, SpongeBob has a lot to do with science, funnily enough. Um, and so when we think about absorption, it's really important to think about what's happening at that molecular level. And there's a lot of different factors that come into play here. There's size, shape, and these determine how those particles are actually going to fit into those little tiny channels in our activated carbon. So again, looking at SpongeBob, you can see he has, I'm going to draw on my screen here if I can, uh, annotation. Okay, well, as you can see on the SpongeBob himself, you can see all these little circles in him, right? If you think of your kitchen sponge, there are all these little places for particles to get trapped, but you can't fit a square peg in a round hole, right? So you have to really think about when you're designing this material, is my material actually gonna be the correct size to pick up what I want it to? Is my material the right shape? The other thing that's even, I think is really cool is electric and chem electric attraction and chemical bonding. So I'm sure some of you in high school or maybe even middle school might've learned about this. So for my younger students, I'll explain this. All across every material, there are different positive and negative sites. So positive being it has a positive charge, negative being it has a negative charge. When those materials interact with each other, positive attracts negative and positive repels positive. There's also, um, and when you get into high school, you'll learn about pH, but being in the correct pH also matters. And so SpongeBob here has to be positively charged in order to attract the negative ion. So we've designed this material being SpongeBob with circular holes of a certain size positive because we want to attract these negatively charged circular objects. And there's also some chemical forces at play at the very molecular level, but we won't get into that today. And so everything else that's in the solution with SpongeBob is going to be rejected and not picked up. So that's another important factor you can think about is maybe we design material to, make, to pick up one thing, but to make sure we don't pick up another thing. Um, that can be really important in engineering context. Um, so we'll move right along. So what do we actually use in my lab? Um, the thing that we use most of the time is pine bark and pine wood. And so we take this natural material. If you ever go to a forestry site where they're harvesting lumber, 
they're, you know, it, it, they cut down the tree, it falls down, and then they run it through this machine, and all of these wood chips and bark spray off. They're skinning trees, essentially. What do you do with that? Well, I'm sure a lot of your parents probably have mulch on their lawn, but that's a really cheap material. It doesn't actually add any value to the waste product gen uh, generated from this process. process. Um, and forestry, pine bark specifically, is a huge industry here in North Carolina. Loblolly pines are actually the most cultivated species in the Southeast. So we chose a waste product that would really hit home for North Carolina. And so we take this raw material and we throw it, this is really cool to me, we throw it in an oven at 700 degrees C Celsius or about 1200 Fahrenheit. You think about it, on a hot day here in North Carolina, it might get up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about 12 times hotter than the hottest day in June or July. And we make sure that there's no carbon when we're burning it, because if you have carbon or oxygen in the air when you're burning um, this wood, it'll catch fire. So in order to make it not catch fire, we throw um, a, a gas that won't react with the organic substance. And what we're left with is this activated carbon that has and so when you burn a material at that really high temperature, you create all of these little channels of the material and it makes it even more porous and a better absorbent um, for picking things up. And so at the tiniest level, what does that actually look like? I remember I showed you a very simple picture of SpongeBob. This is a very high resolution image of what actually happens to the biochar at the tiny level. And so you can see the measurement down here this is 30 micrometers, okay? To give you an example of how small these holes are, your human cells in your body are 100 micrometers. So this is one third of that size. You can also up the temperature while you're making it to get different sized holes. And you can study that in the lab by, you know, putting a bunch of different materials in the oven at different temperatures. And it'll give you, you know, and you run it through this very advanced imaging, and it can give you an idea of how temperature is affecting your material um, and what that might do at the molecular level for when you're designing it to pull things out of solution. Um, and so the lab that I'm a part of is called the Waste Lab, Waste Applied in Science, Technology, and Engineering. And so on this slide, some of the things that we work with, as well as pine bark, are here. Um, and so this lab was established in 2008 under the belief that marrying or combining sustainability with food processing and effective waste management is the past future in the future to innovative and environmentally friendly science and engineering solutions. And I hope you believe me after today that waste is really a pressing issue. And unfortunately, in everything we do, whether that's mining, food, the clothes you wear, um, the roads you walk on, everything has waste. And it's our job as scientists and engineers not only to fix those problems, but to get innovative and to rather than you know going to you know a chemical store and be like, okay, I need this really high grade activated carbon, see if you can make it from something that you can buy at Lowe's. Um, and so again, my picture was going to be right here. But I really challenge all of you today to really think about embracing your waste and really think about loving what's around you, even though it might be viewed as trash, because you can really get creative with it. So sorry, my Zoom like disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> right when you wrapped up. Thank you so much, Victoria. That was amazing. And I learned a great deal <laughs> from that talk. Um, so Thank if you, you are, if you are in the chat and you are curious, I have a question for Victoria. I have a time for just a couple of questions. So you can drop them in the chat. And while people are thinking and Anish is getting ready to speak, um, I would love to kind of hear from you what piqued your curiosity about using waste in different ways? That's a great question. Um, so growing up, I used to work on a horse farm. And so when you work on a farm, right, you have a lot of different 
things that go into you have your feed, you have your hay, you have your water. But what happens like when the horses use that up, right? And so I see like, you know, obviously you have manure, but, and that can be used in these projects, but you also have all this discarded hay, let's say it gets wet. So they're not going to use it anymore. You know, the horse, that's not good for the horse to eat. So they just throw it out. And it's just kind of like, what do you do with that? Why are you wasting it? How can that, you know, you spent good money on this material. How can you continuously use that around the farm? And so growing up, like working on a farm, really like not an actual farm, but a horse farm, it really like opened my mind to that. And then also later in life, my, so my family's from South Africa. Um, and so I went and visited South Africa a few times um, growing up. And so when you get off the airplane at South Africa, it's very different than it is here. There's not, you know, all these suburbs and beautiful towns and beautiful landscaping and pretty trees everywhere. There are in some parts, but South Africa is a very poor country in some parts of it. And so you're driving through and you see all of these people who, you know, are living in shambles and they have nothing. And so how can we use all of the food waste and the textile waste and all of the things that we as a developed society use every day, how can we use that to help people and solve problems um, in those parts of the world too? So that's really what inspired me um, to get creative with something that most people would just throw away. I just, I think it's a challenge, honestly, because yeah, you can do amazing things with, you know, run of the mill, like you get it straight out of the package from a chemical supply company. And we use some of those things to treat our waste um, and make it, into the material we want, but starting with something that's trash and ending up with treasure is really special to me. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Victoria. So you do have several Absolutely. questions in the chat. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking a minute to respond to them while I get Anish ready to do his part. Oh, do you respond over chat? Yes, in, in the okay. chat. Yes, please. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was wonderful. So I know you all are muted, but um, I can hear you clapping. Feel free to give your appreciation in the chat too. Um, and what I will do is I am going to uh, introduce Anish. And so I will just pull up very quickly um, his picture so that you all can see his, uh, Anish's talk is going to be about the importance of always improving. And so Anish is an eighth grade student at Mills Park Middle School in Cary, North Carolina, and has competed at NCSEF two times and received an honorary mention at both of those events. Um, he is very interested in cars and how they work. And he's gonna talk with us this morning about his interest in continuous improvement. And with that, I will stop sharing and I will pass it over to you, Anish. Welcome. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Anish Prajapati, and I'm here to talk about how I got into STEM and how there are things that you can always improve. Anyhow, I first got into STEM when I was in fourth grade. I got invited to join an FLL team, which is a LIGO robotics competition in which a LEGO EV3 robot, as you can see right here, has to go around the table and complete missions to get points. There's another aspect of the competition, which is also to give a presentation on how to solve a problem that the FLL season was based around. For example, if there was a water theme, you have to give like a solution on how to solve a problem with water. And when I first got my hands on the LEGO EV3, I loved it and I wanted to start making things with it. When the competitions were over, I was the one for my team that happened to keep the robots. And over the summer, as any normal kid, I'll just get bored doing nothing. So I decided to start experimenting and building with the LEGO EV3s. And soon enough, I created this, a LEGO robotic RC car. At first, I created a toy that I thought was perfect in every way possible. But after closer examination with the mentality of an adult, I found out that it was not perfect in every way, shape, or form, but instead it had some flaws. Let me explain. You see, this was, this was my first uh, Lego RC car that I actually created by myself. I didn't know how to make a proper steering system. So what I ended up doing was having two motors that were each directly connected to a rear wheel. And to steer, one of the motors would turn off and the other one would remain on. 
making the car turn in a very weird way, like this. As you can see, the car is like turning on the axis of the rear wheel. And since I was going for a realistic approach on this car, this would not have worked. So for my second design, I dedicated one motor for the back for the power, and I could dedicate another one for the steering in the front. And even though this has solved the problem of making it somewhat realistic, it could be a lot better. You see, this, um, this design has an axle that each wheel is connected to, and the motor is in the middle. So when the motor was to rotate, it would rotate the wheels around the axis of the motor. And that's not very realistic compared to actual cars work. So it can be improved. And once again, I create another version of the LEGO RC car steering system. And this time I used a parallelogram, parallelogram steering system that you guessed it, use a parallelogram to steer the wheels. And this caused the wheels to steer in a way that was exactly how wheels on an actual car steers, making it realistic. But I was not satisfied with the car just yet. In future builds, I plan to make cars with things like locking and unlocking differentials, as you can see right here in this picture. This is a prototype of a design that I have in mind, double wishbone suspension, and even headlights. Let me give you another example of always improving. Over the summer, I created a Lego and cardboard clothing folder, and my organization level in my closet skyrocketed. And even though it worked, they had an issue. Only the sides of the folder came up to fold the clothes. So like this side right here and this side right over here would actually fold up to come and fold the clothes. So this means after one cycle of the machine, I would have to manually rotate the piece of clothing on the machine and then press the button again so I can start the cycle again. So, and since it was zombification, I had better things to do with my time rather than spending like three seconds to rotate a piece of clothing on a machine. So what I ended up doing was adding another hinge right here. So now it would fold uh, the right side, the left side, and now the bottom. And now I no longer have to spend three seconds of my life rotating a half folded shirt on the machine. And it, the clothing had sort of ended up like this, which is a nice fold if you ask me. Now this might seem trivial just making like these inventions and stuff, but let me give you an example of how this might actually help in the real world. And more specifically for me, my science project. In my NCSEF science project, I had to find out how different fuel octanes affect the amount of horsepower that an economy car created. I had done this experiment by, by taking my dad's 20 year old Honda Civic, as you can see right here, and putting it on a dyno, which is a machine that you can put a car on, like as you can see, the tire is on the drum of the dyno. And once the wheels start to rotate, it will rotate this drum along with it. And this drum can figure out many, many, many different things about the car, such as its acceleration, its, its speed at, that it's currently going on, its RPM, its horsepower, its torque output, and so on. And I use this dyno to figure out how much horsepower that an 87, an 89, and 93 octane fuels are. You know, if you go to the gas station, there are three different numbers that you can select fuel from. Those are different octanes. So I just find out which one created the most amount of horsepower. And once the experiment was done, I had to take the average of the three tests for each fuel type and create a single line for each octane. When I was first doing the averages, I was uh, taking the data from every 200 RPM. So that means at 3000 RPM, I took a data point from each test for each octane. And then for, uh, like, let's say, for, for example, a 93 octane, I had three points. And then I would average those points together and that will be the point that I got on my graph. Then I went to 3,200 RPM for the 93 octane gasoline. And then I would do it again. And then again, and again, and again, all the way to um, 6,600. And after going through my data analysis once more, I realized that this had a flaw of not being very accurate. And I decided to fix it by adding more data points. So instead of getting the data from every 200 RPM, I now had got it from every 50 RPM. And even though it's very hard to see, 
This makes the graph a lot more accurate and allows people uh, to see more curves. So as you can see right here, there's some curves here and here that weren't there on the old graph, but they show up on this graph. And I realized it can also be more efficient when improving. So originally when I was getting the data points, I put, I got a, a comma separate value from the software that had the, um, all the data. And I put that into a spreadsheet. And then I realized instead of like uh, doing the maths uh, manually by like just going on the spreadsheet, opening up a calculator and just doing the math like that. I used macros and I was able to just make it so much easier and faster. Then my dad showed me a faster method and I realized how much time I wasted. So you might think that all these uh, differences are very tiny, but let me show you just side by side how these different graphs look. So as you can see, this graph right here, this is the old graph for every 200 RPM. And this one is the new one with for every 50 RPM. And as you can see, the difference is minuscule, but it's the little details that matter when it comes to creating the big picture of improving. Like when it comes to mechanical engineering, most of the time things are improved so they can go faster, stronger, and be more precise. But improving can go so, so much farther than that. You can improve non-living things like cars and structures and computers, but you can also improve living things like your body built by working out or lives of plants and animals by taking proper care of them. You can improve abstract things such as relationships and friendships. You can improve skills like public speaking, teamwork and critical thinking and so on. But most importantly for me, I need a skill to start coming up with better titles. Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful, Anish. Thank you so much. And I have to say that mathematics is in my heart. And so I'm so glad that you brought in kind of the continuous improvement in how you were looking at your data set too. It's so, such an important piece of research and kind of understanding the world. And so, Thank you so much for speaking. We are running about five minutes behind. So if you have questions for Anish, if you wouldn't mind dropping them into the chat. And while they do that and Shannon gets ready to present, I just want to ask, it looks like uh, in your world, and I have met your father, but it looks like you're allowed to take things apart and put them back together a whole lot. Maybe some things that yeah. other people's parents wouldn't let them. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? How does that work at your house? So. Uh, the reason why I'm sort of, I guess, if you will, allowed to put things back together is because my parents have seen me do uh, like those Lego techniques, as you saw in those pictures, and they've sort of got the trust in me so I can start building things. So other parents can do this by starting the, by letting their kids like get into whatever field they want. So like if they wanted to get into engineering, which is like mechanical engineering, uh, they could get them some advanced Lego kits, not like those little toy Legos that, I mean, those are great toys, but like you need like those advanced like Lego Technic kits and they can use those kits and they can start to expand their knowledge on how things work. Like I'm starting to use uh, differentials and I, I understand how they work now. And I, sometimes in my free time, I like to look at how different uh, things works in certain parts of the car. And once my parents have saw this, they sort of started to build trust in me think, taking things back together and putting them together and everything. And eventually I started to create a couple things here and them for them. Like they had asked me, hey, Anish, I found out that pineapples ripen faster when they're upside down. So what I had done, I had created a little Lego Technic um, rectangle, if you will, that would hold a pineapple upside down so it ripens faster. And those were the best pineapples I've ever had. But even though those are just, you know, this, this might sound like a very uh, trivial thing of um, upside down pineapples, it can go so much further and allow uh, people to just make more stuff and get into the fuel that they want to get in. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you for expanding our thinking on what mechanics and robotics can do for us. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank it was you. a pleasure doing 
it was an amazing experience uh, doing the talk. All right, great. So if you have more questions for Anish, he'll be around to answer them in the chat. Um, and with that, I am going to share my screen and I am going to introduce our next Spark speaker, who is, which is Shannon. Um, and so Shannon's going to talk to us about fighting perfectionism, being yourself in your research. Uh, so Shannon is a senior studying electrical engineering at North Carolina State University. She began working in a robotics lab during her freshman year of college and throughout college has worked in bioelectronics and biophotonics lab. You're gonna to have to teach me how to say that, Shannon. Um, her current research project is creating a watch that measures hemoglobin levels to diagnose iron deficiency, the most common form of nutritional deficiency in preschool children. Outside of school, Shannon works remotely for MIT Lincoln Labs, a federally funded research and development center working with radar systems. In the fall, she will be starting a PhD at Duke University, working on distributed sensor systems. When not working, Shannon enjoys biking, hiking, and playing with her family's dogs, Charlie, Lucy, and Mocha. Ooh, Mocha, I love it. All right, with that, Shannon, I will mute myself and you are welcome to start when you're ready. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Shannon Pinnell. And um, like was just said, I'm currently a senior studying electrical engineering at NC State. And today I want to tell you about the worst day of my entire life. Well, maybe it wasn't actually the worst day of my entire life, but it really felt like it was in the moment. Let me explain. I'd worked in a few research labs throughout freshman and sophomore year of college. I helped build a robot that sorted tiny fossils to track climate change and a biosensor that detected valproic acid, which is an epilepsy drug in human blood to help, make doc to help doctors make better dosing decisions. From those experiences, I knew I, lo I loved the process of research, but I wasn't super passionate about the work that I was doing. So during the summer after my sophomore year, I joined a biophotonics, you had the pronunciation just right, um, lab working to create a watch that measures blood hemoglobin levels using light instead of the traditional blood drop. You see, the most common form of nutritional deficiency in preschool age children worldwide is iron deficiency anemia, or IDA, which has been linked to poor school performance, increased behavioral problems, and just kind of overall negative outcomes for children. The World Health Organization estimates that 40% of children under five have IDA. So this is a very impactful issue for lots of people. So what's the cure? It, it's simple, consuming more iron, either in the form of iron rich foods like tofu, beef or beans, or taking an iron supplement will get you right back to where you need to be. So it sounds like a pretty easy fix. Why are so many people still struggling? Well, it's a diagnostic issue. For people with easy access to medical resources, an IDA diagnosis is pretty easy. It requires that your doctor order blood tests to see if your hemoglobin levels are within range. And hemoglobin is a protein found in red blood cells that allows oxygen to move from your lungs to other organs in your body. It's also responsible for taking the carbon dioxide byproduct of cellular respiration back to the lungs to get exhaled. And guess what your body needs to make hemoglobin? Iron. So the way an IDA diagnosis is supposed to work is you get your hemoglobin levels checked via blood draw, they're out of range, and you make changes to your diet or supplement routine to eliminate the IDA and you feel better. But think about all the things that go into a blood draw. First, you have to transport yourself to a medical center. Once there, doctors have to have access to the tools to do a safe blood draw. That means sterile office space, available needles, enough skilled medical professionals to actually do the draw, facilities to keep the blood cold while it is transported to a separate lab for processing. You have to have all the needed reagents and equipment to actually do the test. And once you have the output of the test, you have to communicate with the patient and family what the result is. So imagine you're one of the 400 million people the World Health Organization estimates to not have access to quality medical care. A blood draw for a child presenting with fatigue is just probably not going to happen. It's way too resource intensive. So how do we fix this? I believe the best option is to create a better way to diagnose IDA that does not require the resources of a blood draw. This is a project I've been working on for the past two years. We're using a method called continuous wave near infrared spectroscopy to determine the amount of venous hemoglobin present in the wrist. 
And the way we do this is by shining three wavelengths of light through the tissue and then detecting how much light is present at two different distances on the wrist. And the trick is we shine the light at a very specific wavelength. Oxyhemoglobin, the hemoglobin with the oxygen, absorbs light a lot at about 830 nanometers and deoxyhemoglobin, the hemoglobin without the oxygen, absorbs light at about 770 nanometers. And we are lucky that other things in the body don't super absorb light at these wavelengths, or at least it's enough that we can do some math tricks to cancel out their contribution. So if we shine a known amount of light through tissue and some of the light gets absorbed by the hemoglobin, then we can put a light detector at the end of the tissue and we would know how much light got absorbed while it was traveling. And then using some math, we can convert that light value to a hemoglobin value. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into the math today, but we can totally talk about it later if you want. Essentially, we take the ratio of the light put into the tissue with um, the light detected at the end of the tissue, calculate the slope for a bunch of different data points, and use some known absorption coefficients to calculate our hemoglobin values. Sounds easy. We know exactly what math we have to do and what values we need. Now we just have to build it. So that's what I did. I spent a year picking out parts, designing circuits, putting those onto a circuit board designer and testing the circuits. On this slide, you see a flow chart of the system that we ended up designing. So the LED is told to turn on with the microcontroller, which is kind of like a little computer. The light travels through the tissue in this curved shape due to the scattering and refraction effects of the specific tissue we are putting it through. That light is then picked up by, by the detectors, which output a certain amount of voltage based on how much light they see, kind of like a solar panel. Now the voltage signal that comes out of these detectors is super small. The tiniest amount of interference can completely change the value of the voltage that we are measuring, which is what we're using to calculate our hemoglobin values. So if you have an error in this voltage, we are totally throwing off our hemoglobin calculations. But voltages that are bigger are more resistant to interference. So we can amplify our, using, our voltage using this gain block to make sure our value isn't super effective as much. Once that is done, it goes to the data acquisition module, which samples the data and sends it to the microcontroller. And then the microcontroller sends it via Bluetooth to a smartphone for the doctor or whoever to look at. And so we build it. On this slide, you can see the LEDs outlined in red and the detectors in blue, but there were some issues with this design. That super small voltage I was talking about in the short distance from the detector to the game module was picking up interference just sitting in the lab. And that was super not okay. Our data was insanely not right. So we had to figure out where that interference was coming from and do something about it. And so we took lots of measurements and all sorts of different conditions in the lab, outside the lab, outside in perfectly dark, perfectly dark rooms, everywhere we could think of. But the interference was basically the same the entire time. So we thought about our experimental design. We had changed every environmental variable except for what was already on the circuit board. So that got, it, got us thinking, was it the other circuitry on the board that was causing the interference? So we went back and looked at our design and sure enough, there was a wire right next to our output wire that was probably causing some interference. So we redesigned the board so that we had one big board and two little boards with our detectors that connected together. On this slide, you can see the design file on the left and the manufactured board on the right. Our hypothesis was that the extra plastic would insulate us more from other signals and it had the added bonus of putting the LEDs more flush to the skin so ambient light wasn't getting um, caught under and getting into our detectors. And we did testing and the interference is gone. Perfect. Now there's some other issues that we're still working on, but that was a huge hurdle. So now back, now back to the worst day of my life. I was part of a program that funded my work that semester. It was awesome. They paid me to do research. And if any of you get the chance to do an REU, which is a research experience for undergraduates, I highly recommend it. Usually they happen over the summer, but this one was during the semester. Anyway, part of this program was that I had to give a presentation in front of faculty members and experts in the field that I was working in about my work. And when I tell you I was scared out of my mind for this talk, I mean it. I prepared for weeks, making sure I could talk about why my resources, uh, research was important. I made sure my diagrams were correct. I took pictures of my work and I reviewed how everything operated. And it came to the day of the talk and I gave my presentation and I told them, everything that we had done and what our plans were moving forward and I finished and I asked if there were any questions. Now I was the fourth student to go on this day and each student only got about one question. Usually the professor just wanted to go back in their slides to see a graph again or to see a picture again. But I asked for questions and I saw 
four hands go up. Four. I was terrified. The first question hit me out of left field. They asked how hemoglobin levels change over the course of the day. Well, I had no idea. I had spent the last year looking at electronics, not blood. But I pulled myself together and said in a very polite way, I'm not sure I will get back to you on that. Three hands left to go. The second question wanted me to go back in my slides to graph. Easy, perfect, got it. Two hands to go. The third person asked why we didn't use a specific type of part for one of the electronics. Well, the truth was I had never heard of that. So I said in what I hope was a way that sounded smart that I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and it, that seemed to go okay. So one to go. Now this person was a big researcher. He was in charge of multiple labs. He gets tons of funding and is super well respected. He asked about a specific detail of the math that we were doing to get from the light levels to the hemoglobin levels. And the truth was, it had been a long time since I had looked at any of that math. I was trying to diagnose electronics issues. So I did what I could, and I told him the name of the paper that outlines the math, except it somehow didn't come out right. I told him to read a paper by Suzuki to know what the math was, not thinking that this person does research in this field. Of course he has read Suzuki. Everyone has read Suzuki. Essentially, what I had told this person who had dedicated their entire life to this field was that he needed to learn the basic of biophotonics. It was like telling Einstein to go read an algebra textbook. I was mortified, but sat down and listened to the rest of the presentations. Later that night, I got an email from my professor. He said, you did a great job. Great job? What are you talking about? I made a fool of myself. A couple days later, I was talking to a mentor and she ended up laughing at me, which I thought was a bit odd. I didn't think the situation was funny at all. But eventually she stopped laughing and told me that I had the experience that many people will have when they start presenting their research. When you give a presentation to experts in the field, they're going to bring up questions you never dreamed of. So it's very not com it's common to not know the answer. And the best thing to do is to admit you don't know and learn the answer for next time. And eventually it gets easier. Over time, I made a conscious effort to extend myself grace during my work. If I made a mistake, I tried to not let it get to me, to just note down what I could do better next time and move on. And my mentor was right, it does get easier. Later, someone asked me how hemoglobin levels change throughout the day and I knew the answer. There were also a lot of questions I didn't know the answer to and that is okay. Because I know as I continue working in my field, I will gather knowledge and experience and I trust myself to become an expert one day. And that is what I hope you come away with today. I hope you know that research is fun and rewarding and valuable, but I also hope you know that mistakes happen and you will probably say something dumb in a presentation and that is okay because you are very early on in your research journey and there's still so much time to learn and explore. To finish out the other day, I saw the professor I told to read Suzuki and he smiled and waved at me and I waved back and continued down the hall and everything was fine. So my advice to you is to try to let go of perfectionism and give yourself permission to make mistakes. Um, that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take any questions in the chat. Thank you. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Shannon. I truly enjoyed that. Um, and while while uh, our participants are thinking and dropping questions in the chat, and while Noah gets ready to present, um, I would love to hear from you. Uh, being in electrical engineering, you are doing a lot of work in biology. And so how... How did that all come to be and how did you recognize that you needed to bring in the other sciences? Well, I think when you start looking at these really hard problems like medical issues or even waste like we were talking about, it, to, to create an effective solution, you have to have a really deep understanding of what exactly the problem is. So that's a lot of biology. But if we're wanting to use electronics to solve those issues, then you also need to have that deep understanding of electronics because um, right, the electronic systems that we use are very specific and pretty, pretty advanced. And so it's about bringing the two together to create an effective solution. And unless you understand what the problem is completely and fully from all angles, you're probably going to miss something or your solution might not take into account a certain part of biology, for example. Um, and so it's really about bringing experts together and trying to talk to different um, experts so that you can take your work and use their knowledge and build on their understanding. So we talked to a lot of, or read a lot of papers also from like biology professors and people who had done work in optics. Um, and of course, like medical professionals to talk about, wait, would a watch actually be helpful? Would it be more helpful to have like an ankle strap? 
like would that tissue be, um, would that tissue act differently? And so I think if you really want to create something that's going to help people, you have to be able to come at any issue from a lot of different angles. Wonderful, thank you so much, Shannon. There are several really good questions in the chat for you if you have time to hang out and see uh, how many you can respond to. We appreciate that. And thank you once again for presenting. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was awesome. Of course. All right, and so with that, I will switch over to our next speaker, this is Noah, and I'm just gonna share my screen and give you a little bit of information about Noah as he prepares for his talk, which is science in the stellar graveyard. Noah conducts research in computational astrophysics, studying the deaths of stars at NC State and testing general relativity in the LIGO Astrophysics Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology. In recognition of his work, he earned the Goldwater Scholarship and the Astronaut Scholarship. He also served as the CEO and co-founder of the Environmental Justice and Air Quality Technology Nonprofit CIVR. This fall, Noah will begin doctoral study in gravitational wave astrophysics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. That's wonderful. And Noah, if I said that nonprofit name wrong, I know you told me how to say it. Can you please make that correction so that people do not misunderstand? Uh, no, yeah, almost. It is Seaver, but admittedly it wasn't the best chosen name, but uh, that's a little easier to fix than the science. Um, but in the meantime, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can every, can y'all hear me okay, by the way? Yep, we can see it well and we can hear you. All right, wonderful. So again, uh, thank you for that introduction. My name is Noah, uh, and I think I forgot to mention in the introduction, but I'm also studying physics and math uh, at North Carolina State University. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about, uh, as it says here, science in the stellar graveyard. Um, and more specifically, kind of a broad overview of what that means uh, and kind of my journey to actually doing that kind of science. Uh, so the stellar graveyard isn't as spooky as you might think. Uh, it's the domain of the deaths of stars, also called supernovae, uh, and their remnants in the form of things like neutron stars and black holes. Maybe you've heard of these before, but if you haven't, uh, neutron stars are these super dense remains of a star after it's died, uh, made up of all kinds of nuclear weirdness. And black holes are their even denser cousins uh, from which no light can escape. Uh, so these are crazy objects, and thus the stellar graveyard represents the most extreme frontier of modern science as these are violent astrophysical laboratories that push our understanding of physics to its very limits. And in my undergraduate career, I've had the privilege of being able to use these laboratories to study the fundamental nature of things like nuclear physics and gravity itself. But how do we actually study these laboratories, right? They're very far away. These are strange objects, objects that we don't fully understand. Uh, and you know, having already done science, y'all already have an idea of what it means to study something. You come up with some quantity you want to observe. You find a way to observe that quantity because you think it will tell you something about your physical system. Like you might use a microscope to study a cell or a telescope to study a star. But recently we actually discovered a new way to study these systems uh, using ripples in the very fabric of space-time itself called gravitational waves. It turns out that when two black holes or two neutron stars merge together, they send out these ripples in the very gravitational firmament of the universe, causing space to stretch and squeeze in a periodic fashion. The intensity and patterns of these ripples, of this stretching and squeezing, is actually determined by the property of the black holes or neutron stars that merged, and there's an added benefit of, unlike light from a star, gravitational waves won't be blocked by material in between us and the source of the signal. And so these are really cool signals that we can use to probe these astrophysical laboratories. Now, by the time these waves reach Earth, they're very, very, very tiny, causing space to stretch and squeeze uh, on the order of one one thousandth of a proton, so incredibly small distances. And that means they're pretty hard to detect, but not impossible. And so the question is, how do we actually detect these? Well, it's a combination of high-powered lasers and fancy guess and check. 
Uh, it turns out that if you want to detect a gravitational wave, you need to detect a very, very tiny change in distance. Because again, space is stretching and squeezing in a periodic fashion. And to do that, we use something called a laser interferometer. And basically, these are two lasers in a big L shape. Uh, and using a complex system of mirrors and quadruple pendulums and vacuum chambers and all kinds of fancy equipment, we can measure the distance along these arms extremely precisely. And so as a gravitational wave passes through and stretches out one arm and squeezes the other, we can detect those tiny changes in distance and say, oh, we've detected a signal. Right now, there are actually four of these in the world. So there are two of these gravitational wave detectors in the US, one in Italy, and one in Japan, with more being built all the time. Now, they aren't perfect. These aren't perfect devices. It's really hard to measure distance and see changes in distance, much less than a proton. But in 2015, we were actually able to detect gravitational waves from a binary black hole merger for the first time. Two black holes spiraled in at nearly the speed of light and merged together into a bigger black hole. And this was an incredible scientific event. But now we want to know things like how large were the merging black holes? Where were they in the universe? But if you didn't already know, physics is pretty hard. And most of these events are really far away. And so even as we try to answer these questions, we're never 100% certain about our answers. Um, now, I'm not sure how y'all approach a hard physics or math problem, but what I usually do is guess and check. I come up with a good, an answer I think might be right. I might have some intuition for what the answer might be. And then I use the physics and math I've already learned to see if that's a reasonable guess, to see if it matches my assumptions about how a certain physical system works. Um, well, a computer can do this same process, but millions of times a second, much faster than I can. And so when we're not entirely certain about our answer to a scientific question, we can instead use the science we currently understand to make rules for how to come up with a good guess and how to check it, and then tell the computer to use those rules and come up with a bunch of guesses and tell us how good it thinks those guesses are. And in this way, we construct a distribution of possible answers to our question, a statistical distribution. Uh, and if you haven't heard of it before, this process is actually called Bayesian inference. And so that's how, once we, with our fancy lasers, determine we've heard a gravitational wave signal, that's how we actually turn that into scientific understanding. In my own research, I've actually been working on modifying a little bit this guess and check process so that we can test for really tiny deviations uh, due to changes in our understanding of gravity in a gravitational wave signal. Uh, but I didn't want to focus too much on my specific research today. And if you're happy, it was actually just made public, so I'll drop it in the chat in a moment. But I wanted to talk how I got there. Um, I didn't actually learn a lot of these skills or this science in the classroom, which often felt really stressful, both before I started research uh, in college and even while doing it. Like, I don't know what's going on. But every step of the way, I felt like there is a kind of science mountain in front of me, like composed of all of the knowledge and things that I don't know, and I can't even see the top. And that'll only really be a real scientist when I've reached the top. But of all the random physics and math that I've learned, the most important thing I've actually learned is how harmful this mindset is. Just like climbing, science is step by step. And it turns out that during all of those times that I felt so intimidated by all of the things I don't know, by my lack of experience, by the failures I experienced, I was actually learning new things that I'm still using today. Like I have two examples of some of my very first science projects. On the left was one I actually did for my middle school science fair way back in 2013. Um, I try to, you know, test thermodynamic properties of random liquids I could find in my kitchen, like vinegar or chocolate syrup, but I didn't know thermodynamics, and I didn't have a well-formed scientific hypothesis, and so the project both failed and wasn't super interesting, and I felt so bad about it, but I actually learned a lot of things, like how do you take good notes in the process of doing science? How do you come up with new hypotheses as your old ones fail? Or on the right, uh, I have one of the earliest prototypes of an air quality sensor I tried to build. I wanted to measure air quality in my hometown, but I didn't know how. So I built one from scratch. I put some electronics in a box, like put it in an Amazon delivery package, taped it all up, and then it rained. And I'm like, well, that's not going to work. 
So I'm like, but what if I put it in a plastic trash bag? Like, okay, that'll protect it from the rain, but then I can't get air in. So what do I do then? And I kept trying things and ultimately the prototype failed anyway. But I learned a lot, not only about, you know, how do I program, but how do I try out new scientific ideas in the face of continued failure? And I still use these same skills to this very day. And so all that is to say, I couldn't have navigated the stellar graveyard without any of these experiences. And even now, the things all of you are doing at this science fair and elsewhere are preparing you for whatever next research or other kind of endeavor you do. In your research, you'll find unexpected connections everywhere. Like I couldn't have imagined that studying air quality in my hometown would help me test general relativity with astrostatistics, but indeed it does. And so for all of my fellow scientists here today, I wanted to emphasize that being a scientist isn't about reaching the top of that mountain, but by using all of your unique experiences and knowledge to find a way to the next step. Uh, so studying the, cell, uh, studying the stellar graveyard might be the kind of scientific journey you'll embark upon, but regardless, it connects us all. Uh, because it turns out that when stars die, they leave behind stardust composed of all of the heavy elements necessary for life. And so in the words of Vera Rubin, one of the most influential astronomers of the 20th century, uh, each one of you can change the world for you are made of star stuff and you are connected to the universe. Thank you. Oh, that is amazing. Thank you so much, Noah. That was wonderful. Um, one of my favorite topics. So I'm very impressed. <laughs> and uh, we, we are very short on time, but I want to give folks the opportunity to drop questions in the chat so we can capture those for Noah. Um, and then I, I, I am a mathematician by training. And so I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about how you're using kind of multiple kinds of mathematics and sciences to to push your research forward? It's actually this, that's a really great question. Um, and basically, I really love my work because I'm right in the middle of, you know, really advanced physics theory on one side and actual, how do we make real observations on the other? And so what I have to do is try and figure out a way to connect those things. So some days I'll study equations other people have come up with for say how you might observe theoretically a deviation from general relativity. You can parameterize these in a way we call phenomenologically uh, divert, um, divorced from any specific physics theory, but it takes a lot of math to do that, both a lot of algebra, a lot of calculus, and a lot of physics. And then on the other hand, I say, so once we've detected a signal, we have to use statistics to guess these phenomenological deviation parameters. If GR is right, they're zero. But if GR is a little bit wrong, they're a little bit not zero. And so we're trying to use math to detect in real signals those tiny deviations. Thank you so much, Noah. That was great. Um, and please do, if you have questions for Noah, drop them in the chat and I can capture them and send them his way. Uh, we are right at 1130, which is the time we will close our op opening um, Spark Talks. And so before we jump off, I just want to take a moment to thank all, uh, all four of our Spark speakers, Victoria, Anish, Noah, and Shannon. Thank you so much. You truly have been inspiring for us today um, and definitely kicked off the 2022 Science and Engineering Fair in an excellent way. For those of you who are on as participants, I want to invite you to join us at 1140. We will take a quick break. For our distinguished guest speaker, Tony, talking to us about um, pushing yourself to add coding to that list of fundamental skills for uh, your generation as you take the lead. And then immediately following uh, the lunch speaker, we will have live tours of the College of Sciences. So get your thinking going for what do you want to know about that college-like experience. Um, and we will host our two guests from NC State. 